Okay. Is there really audio? <laughs> Is there no audio for this whole five minutes? You got me? Come on, tell me in the chat. Was I talking to dead air for uh, for three, five minutes? Give me a five, five if you would. Anybody? Give me. Okay, there we go. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, Bill's using a different computer than normal, and I, I did it. So, yeah, well, that was... Uh, um, that was good. So I'm glad that we didn't miss too much important. I just gave you the addresses and that and explained that I'm going to, uh, uh, what do you call it, be doing it. And I had said on the mic that uh, I can't hear this show on the PC. Unlike my Mac, I can hear what's going on. So I can't tell when I'm muted. And I thought Hog was just messing with me because <laughs> he puts up the muted thicket all the time. So... Uh, I, I do see in the chat, I'm glad you can hear me now. So, like I said, my Mac died, uh, the screen went out. I should have a new one by Christmas, but uh, um, we found the box the PC was in and, and I'm up and limping by with this and uh, getting it done. And I'm back in my uh, regular schedule. I'm not gonna review what I talked to you in uh, uh, silent mode over, but uh, here, don't forget to tune in to Michael. Today is bended knee when I go off the air. And then uh, 5.30 a.m. Pacific time, he's doing a study. His Luke study has been amazing. And then on Sunday, he's still going through Psalms with his uh, lovely wife, Linda. And sometime after the first of the year, we'll be doing, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, more profit clubs. I just need some uh, to get fully settled, and I'm not... I haven't even really started unpacking yet here, so and we, I need a little bit more time to get ready, and then we'll be doing profit clubs. So with that, I wanted to start the review of, of Revelation, and uh, let me just come back to a picture. What happened to Bill? How come you can't see me? Sorry. Okay, you're gonna get me full face and black. Let's try this again. Sorry, everything's messing up on me today. All right, what I explained in the uh, earlier is I don't have a light here, so it's a making me a little dark. It, it's not that I have a great tan. I don't tan in Kauai. But uh, we're going to uh, kind of go through Revelation, all the big issues, because I thought uh, a lot of this is going to be so different from anything you've ever learned before that it was worth reviewing. So let's some basics. The, the, the word apocalypse comes from two Greek words, apa meaning away from, like to take away from, and calypsis, meaning to cover. So when you put those two words together, it's to take away the covering or unveiling. So an apocalypse is an unveiling. Now, people will tell you it was officially added to the canon in 8397 by the council at Carthage, but that's a little misleading because that's the first council that added any book to the Bible, you know, in the New Testament. Prior to that, there are a list of books in the New Testament. Um, and the book of Revelation is, is in there. And the author identifies himself as John. And um, some scholars claim that this John is a different John than the John the Apostle. I, I did correct these spellings, and I see they're not done. So I'll have to fix that for you in your PDF. I'm seeing misspellings on my copy of what's going on. So the uh, he identifies himself as John, but I, some people say he's a different John. The early church believes John the Apostle wrote this. Um, the evidence is so substantial, I don't think there's any real doubt that it's the Apostle John. Uh, but, you know, uh, what do you call it? Scholars love the debate stuff, and they love to come up with their own ideas. So uh, that doesn't surprise me. The question, the big question was, when was it written? 
because if this book was written during the reign of Nero, and Nero was in AD 54 to 68, if it happened during his time frame, then the preterist understanding of Revelation is almost bulletproof it, as far as how to properly understand it. It matches the, the style of the book, the genre of the book. Everything works. The problem for the biggest problem for the preterist view is the early evidence supports a late date during the reign of Domitian. Now, Domitian reigned from 81 to 96 AD, and most people place the dating of the writing of this book in the 90s. If it was written in the 90s, it cannot be prophetic as it claims to be about things that happened in between 66 and 70 AD. So the preterist view has a, uh, it, it rises and falls on that claim of when it was written. And the evidence for early date is actually comes very late. You're looking at like 500 AD when you have people start claiming that it was written earlier than 90s. All the early references talk about it being written during a time of Domitian, and that's too late for the preterist view to be 100% complete. That doesn't mean preterism is 100% false. What I explained to you in this study is that all of the interpretive grids that I have looked at, preterism, partial preterism, um, idealism, uh, historicism, and all the variations of futurism have some validity, some credibility to them. And it led me to believe that God chose this uh, style of writing so that he can convey a multiple layers of meaning in one uh, book. And I showed you in when we studied the Quadriga of Scripture that it is very common for any passage of the Bible to have four meanings. And uh, so, like I said, the early dates supported by internal evidence, clues in the books, okay? In Revelation 11, 1 to 2, the temple's still standing. So this book doesn't seem to know the temple's been destroyed. Uh, Revelation 13, 18, the number of the beast's name. Uh, now, this gets a little uh, playing, but, you know, the way this numerology works if you don't find it, uh, that the numbers add up to 666, you just choose and you pick your language. I'll do it in Greek. If that doesn't work, I'll do it in Latin. If that doesn't work, I'll do it in Hebrew. And, and they play around with numbers. So I'm not as impressed with the number of 666 adding up to uh, Nero, Caesar Nero in Hebrew, because the book's not written in Hebrew. <laughs> it's written in Greek. And then Revelation, you get the seven heads are seven mountains or in seven kings. Six has fallen and one is. Nero was the sixth emperor of Rome. Uh, if he had fallen, and then we're talking about the next emperor, and that this places a book after 68 AD and before 70 AD, that 100% fits that description. And the other churches had become lukewarm or left their first love. But for an early date, this fall from the faith would have needed to had fallen fast. These churches were just established. If you wrote this early um, in the in the late sixties, early seventies, then those churches left their first love very quickly. Now the late date is supported by external evidence and some internal evidence. The early church fathers support a late date. Arrhenius uh, was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, right? So that you're talking about two students away from John, the actual author, and Arrhenius says that John uh, saw the vision near the end of Domitian's reign. But while describing Domitian as being almost in his own day, he says that there are good and ancient copies. Well, that, that seems to be conflicting, but he does name Domitian, so that puts uh, this writing during the time of Nero as off, or even the emperor immediately following Nero. Now, Laodicea, who's mentioned in this uh, book, had a major earthquake in the 60s, AD 60s, 
which would have been it would have been considered a wealthy during Nero's reign, would it have been? It had just been destroyed by an earthquake. It was just building back up after a major earthquake. I don't know that during the time of Nero, you would have thought it was wealthy, but 30 years later, in the 90s, it had recovered from the earthquake and it was a very wealthy city. Polycarp wrote the Philippi about the church of Smyrna and says that they didn't know the Lord during the life of Paul. If there is no church in Smyrna until after Paul wrote to Philippi in AD 60 or 62, it seems odd for it to be one of the major churches chosen for a letter a few years later. That seems to push for the later date. And the internal evidence for the later date uh, seems to show emperor worship going on in Revelation 13. And Domitian's the first emperor to demand worship as him as a god, okay? And the persecution by Nero was largely limited to Christians in Rome, but these churches were in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And uh, John's talking about persecution there. So all of that seems to hold up to a later date, right? So... Like I said, this is an example of apocalyptic literature. It's a style of writing that was popular during the Second Temple period. So Second Temple is like 580 BC to 70 AD. We have extant apocalypses written between about 300 BC and 100 AD. Um, and they follow a certain style, a certain pattern, right? Modern scholars call this style of literature apocalyptic. And John's apocalypse follows the imagery of apocalyptic passages we find in, in biblical books like Daniel and Zechariah. And, but one of the things you learn from apocalypse is they often have an angel as a guide. John has an angel. They often speak of dragons and stars falling. John's got dragons and stars falling. The subject of apocalypse deal with struggles between Jews and other nations. And we have books like the uh, Book of Enoch and Baruch that do exactly that. And then I took you to a great example of apocalyptic literature in the Septuagint version of, the, of Esther. There is both a prologue to Esther, which has a dream, and an epilogue that has an interpretation of that dream. In the prologue, we got dragons fighting global war going on, all this stuff. And then in the explanation, you find out the two dragons are Haman and Mordecai and the two nations, uh, the dispute between the nations is pictured as global conflict when it was nothing global about it. So um, that indicates to us that if John's apocalypse follows those other the same pattern as other apocalypses, then it's going to be about Rome and their persecution of Israel, which is exactly what the preterist view says it's about. That's why I said it. They have the strongest argument if the book's written in the, in the 60s. The biggest problem with their argument is the evidence shows it was written in the 90s. So your four major interpretive grids, and I'll deal with what I mean by an interpretive grid in a minute, are preterism, which is divided into full preterism and partial preterism. Full preterism is considered outside of orthodoxy in Christianity. The preterists are your brothers and sisters in Christ, but because full preterism denies that Jesus is coming back physically, because he came back in 70 AD, according to them, and he's not coming back again, because they deny that in Orthodox Christianity, in the, uh, in the early church and the church councils all affirm that coming back, full preterism is considered outside of traditional orthodoxy and historic orthodoxy. But that doesn't mean they're not Christians and they're not saved. Partial preterists, which most preterists you're going to run into are partial preterists. R.C. Sproul, a bunch of other people are going to be partial preterists. They think most of the book was fulfilled in 70 AD, but there are some prophecies of, that are about the second coming of Jesus to judge the living and the dead and that, that are still future. Then historicism has always had some 
uh, proponents, but it really became very popular from the time of the Reformation forward. And they saw that the book of Revelation was about church history all through from the resurrection of Jesus till the second coming of Jesus in the, in the judgment, and they take that position. Then idealism sees this book as describing a uh, eternal struggle between good and evil and things that are timelessly true for everybody. All other interpretive grids have idealistic aspects to them because they all think the book applies and has application to us in this day, whether it was about Rome or if it was about church history for the last 2,000 years, it still has application to us. And even futurists that think it's still future to us think there's applications to the book for us today. So idealism um, is partially involved in every other um, interpretive grid, but what separates idealism out as a interpretive grid is when it excludes uh, prophecies being fulfilled in a preterist view or historicist view or in a futurist view that it's only a uh, timeless truth being there. And then you have futurism, and I'm going to deal with the breakdown of futurism as we, as we move on. The four major views divide over whether were all the prophecies fulfilled in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple and the sacrificial system, or were most of them uh, fulfilled then, or were none of them filled, or were they fulfilled in type, like the Antiochus Epiphanes is uh, does the abomination that makes desolate promised in the book of Daniel, and that happened before Jesus, you know, but then Jesus says to them, when you see the abomination that makes desolate, that tells you there's going to be at least two fulfillments of that prophecy, is was that how that fulfillment in 70 AD fits in there? They also um, divide over the, uh, the idea of the millennial kingdom. Is, is it a prediction of a literal thousand-year reign of Christ on, uh, on earth before a final battle with Satan? Is it Christ ruling and reigning in our hearts as we speak right now, right? Or does it picture, is it a metaphor for our lives in eternity with Christ, right? And so early church um, fathers were divided on the millennial kingdom. And you're going to find scholars throughout the history have been divided. And then um, so that millennial kingdom seems to be whether you're amillennial, which means no millennial kingdom, actually should be called a realized millennial, that they're in a millennial kingdom right now. And then, or premillennialism, which means that uh, we're all going back to be with God and uh, judgments happen before the millennial, which means that the millennial kingdom is for, is a picture of us living eternally with Christ, or postmillennialism that, uh, Jesus is coming back after the millennial kingdom. After we Christianize the whole world, um, you're going to see postmillennialism most commonly uh, connected with what's now called kingdom now theology and uh, the NAR movement, the New Apostolic Reformation are big into that. Um, if you think the world's becoming more and more Christian, I, I think you need to take your, uh, put some glasses on and look around. That's one of the easiest positions, I think, to uh, disprove just by looking at the world. It's not happening. Now, like I said, preterism divides into full preterism. The full preterism is amillennialist, meaning that we're in the millennial kingdom right now. Okay? Christ is ruling and reigning today. And uh, they were fulfilled. Most of the prop all of prophecies in this book were fulfilled in AD 70. Partial preterism generally agrees with full preterism, but it does allow for a future return of Jesus, right? Now, historicism also divides on how it interprets the two beasts. Remember, you had the beast that came out of the sea and the beast that came out of the earth. And most people see that one beast being the Antichrist and the other one a false prophet. 
historicists see the two beasts as both descriptions of the Roman Empire. One, the beast in its secular power, and the other beast in its papal power. So this is where they uh, connected it to the Catholic Church, and, and the Protestant reformers held that this was an, uh, against Rome in its secular uh, manifestation and ultimately would be against Rome in its religious manifestation underneath the Holy Roman Empire. And then uh, they said the amillennial view or realized millennial view is pretty typical for historicists that we're in the millennial kingdom now. Some historicists hold that we're in a post-millennial view that uh, we will Christianize the world and usher in the return of Christ. And some historicists, although few in number, hold the premillennial view that um, the aspects of this book shift to prophecy at the return of Jesus set up his literal millennial kingdom. So not all historicists fit into one camp on that thing. And like I said, idealism, uh, all of these groups are idealistic in some fashion. And when we looked at... at Beale's commentary pretty heavily. He had a lot of idealistic tones. He clearly had some futurist positions, and but there was idealism in a, in a lot of the ways he was interpreting. And when you take the way I presented this and tried to show you that um, this is about the struggle between good and evil, and that it will deal with all the... Uh, celestial beings that have disobeyed God as well as humans that are in disobedience with God. And you see that as a, uh, a bigger uh, picture, then uh, my position is going to have some idealistic aspects to it as well. And I also think everybody agrees that there's timeless truths in this book for us to understand. Now, futurism, which is what going to land, most of us are going to be futurist at some point. I want to um, just distinguish between different types of futurism. Classical futurism, and there was a lot of them in the early church, uh, the very early church. A lot of the early church fathers were futurists. They were very evenly divided over whether the millennial kingdom was a metaphor or um, if it was going to be a literal thousand-year reign. The um, early church fathers that held to a literal millennial kingdom, were, it's described as chileism, chileism uh, from the Latin word for a thousand. And so there's, they are pretty harsh on each other if they hold to a, uh, a thousand-year reign or not in the way they talk to each other, but there's no... Uh, dominant view. You can't look and say 80% held this and 20%. It's pretty 50-50 of those that were futurists. They consistently believed that Christians were going to go through the Great Tribulation. People that tell you that currently hold to what's called dispensational premillennialism will tell you that some of the early church fathers were uh, premillennialists. That's true but not in the sense they are. None of the early church fathers taught a pre-tribulation rapture. Zero, okay? There's a uh, sermon by a guy named Pseudo Ephraim. Now, pseudo means false, meaning that they don't believe the guy who wrote this sermon is actually even named Ephraim. Uh, they, they believe this is a fabricated story, but there's a sermon by a guy named Pseudo Ephraim that seems to introduce the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. Prior to that, uh, I mean, nobody taught it. It wasn't taught again after that sermon by anybody that we have record of until a couple Catholic um, scholars came up with a, a reinterpreted revelation in the book of Daniel because the rep reformers were going around saying uh, the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon and Pope Leo X is the Antichrist. And so they, they came up with a new interpretation for the book of Revelation that said faithful Catholics are going to get raptured and this is not true. And they, they introduced the idea. 
Uh, the Catholic Church rejected that interpretation. It was put on the shelf for years. Uh, it was found in a, in a British library, uh, republished, and then you, in the 1800s, and then you're going to get Charles Nelson Darby, who comes out and popularizes it. But he didn't come up with it. He was rewriting. This is this is a uh, theology put out by a couple Catholic scholars to refute the uh, end times view of the Reformation teachers. Okay. Now, later adaptations of classical futurism held, and they looked at the 70-week uh, prophecy of Daniel, and they held that the tribulation was going to be seven years divided into two three-and-a-half-year periods. I don't know that that's true, okay, but that is what they held to, and that the church would go through the first half of the tribulation but not go through the second half because the second half was uh, God's wrath is being poured out, and we're told we're not destined under wrath. So you had this kind of mid-tribulation idea. Then you have what's called pre-wrath position, and they said, well, somewhere after the midpoint of the tribulation, but before God pours out the trumpet and bowl judgments, might not be three and a half years exactly, could be anywhere, but it's going to be after midpoint, then uh, the church is raptured, and then you have the post-tribulation, but before the day of the Lord. And this is where I landed, okay? It's very similar to pre-wrath view, except it doesn't see the great tribulation as en ending before the seventh seal is open, okay? Or it, it sees the great tribulation as ending before the seventh seal is open. So this was in Revelation 6. And... You go through six seals. None of it's called the wrath of God. The seventh seal introduces the trumpet and bowl judgments, or the trumpet judgments, and then which introduce the bowl judgments. They are called the wrath of God. Um, and I don't see the tribulation as being seven years long. Uh, the Bible says multiple times that it is 42 months, uh, 1120 days. It's, you know... Uh, it describes it in a time, time, and half a times. I don't know how many ways you can say something's three and a half years long and uh, conclude on the other end that it's seven years long. Okay. So then we're going to get to dispensational futurism. And I really took this position to task harder than any of the other ones only because it's the position I know most of you have been taught. Now, dispensational futurism or dispensational premillennialism, it's sometimes called, are based on the pillars of dispensational theology. I happen to believe all the pillars of dispensational theology are incorrect, okay? Now, that puts me at odds with a lot of great scholars, okay? So let me just tell you what they are, because I know you don't have pastors, most of you, getting up and teaching you what dispensational theology says. But it holds that God has dealt with man differently during four, or more commonly seven, different dispensations. There's a dispensation of innocence, a dispensation of law, they got all this, and we're in a dispensation of grace. They hold it, they were dealt differently. Now, originally, dispensationalist theology held that you were saved by different criteria during those periods. Uh, it is evolving. Dispensational theology evolves. Not everybody holds that position. Uh, one of my position is if there's any way to be saved other than through the uh, faith in the blood of Jesus, then God lied to Jesus when Jesus said, if there's any other way, take this cup from my hand. So um, I think that's absolutely wrong. The law found in the Old Testament according to dispensational theology, this includes the moral civil and ceremonial law has been completely abolished under Christ. Okay? That means thou shalt not kill is no longer prohibited in the Old Testament. Do you understand? Now, we're called to uh, live the law of Christ, which also uh, says you're not supposed to kill people, but that you're not bound by the Old Testament law. I think that is also untrue. Okay? It claims to maintain a literal interpretation of Scripture. One, I don't think a literal interpretation of Scripture is correct 
but it doesn't even maintain that. And I, and I've showed you in numerous times that it does not. And it claims God has two distinctly different eternal plans and purposes for mankind. One, which specifically concerns ethnic nation of Israel, and one which concerns the Christian church. So you have two different plans from God. It maintains a stark divide between the church and Israel. So what you have is two classes of believers, Israel and the church. They are totally separate groups with different origins and different destinies. And it claims that the church began in Acts 2 and the, and the book of Revelation, uh, starting in Revelation uh, 4 through 1, returns to the 70th week of Daniel. And because the church wasn't here, according to dispensational theology, in the first 69 weeks of Daniel, it's not here for the 70th week. I think all of the... Uh, what do you call it, assumptions in that statement are completely wrong. Uh, it holds to a pre-tribulation rapture and believes Christians will uh, escape the great tribulation. And he said there is no verse in the Bible that supports that. And I know people will tell you they do, but if you look at the actual verses, they're all talking about the day of the Lord or escaping God's wrath. And you can't show me anywhere in the... Um, Bible that says the great tribulation is God's wrath for you and poured out, unless you take the position that all of those, uh, the bull and trumpet judgments, are in the tribulation, and I don't think that's defendable position either. Dispensational futurism claims that the millennial kingdom will be a real, literal reign of Christ on the earth for a thousand years before the final battle of Satan. Uh, they have the New Jerusalem being a literal city. They have uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb being a, mar a literal marriage where we get married to Jesus. All of that, I think, is is completely uh, nonsensical, and I, and I tried to show you that in this study. And like I said, I focus more on that interpretive grid because it's what everybody I know has been taught. And, and it was it needs to be refuted. The other ones, I didn't think too many people were leaning towards full preterism, so I didn't spend as much time refuting it. Okay. Now, I tried to teach you a methodology for understanding Scripture rather than starting with an interpretive grid. And what do I mean? What's the difference between that? Right? <laughs> When we looked at the book, we considered the genre, that it is an apocalyptic literature. We looked at the historical, political, cultural, grammatical, stylistic, and perceived intentional content of the author and the original audience, how they would have understood it. We looked at the fact that the book says it was written in signs, right? The book says it is prophetic, right? But the book says... That tells you it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's that subject about? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it also says it's to tell you some things that are short, much shortly take place. And shortly could be quickly. So rather than shortly from the time of John, uh, a lot of people think that means that when, when it occurs, it will happen in, a, in over a short period of time. And we have seen other Old Testament and New Testament writers who quote, paraphrase, make allusions to, or create echoes of segments of earlier Bible writers, and then either add detail to those points for clarification, or use those points to make a new theological point. And I've taken a position that John did the same thing. He does it in the Gospel of John, he does it in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he does it on a... On a insane level in the book of Revelation where he is just quoting and making allusions and paraphrasing Old Testament passages like crazy and our methodology was if we can go back and figure out what he's quoting and making allusions to we can look at what it meant there it'll mean the same thing when John's quoting it now I also spent time looking at the literal principle of biblical interpretation and I showed that it's demonstrably false, okay? Now, the literal uh, principle of biblical interpretation asserts 
the, the biblical text is to be interpreted according to the plain meaning conveyed by its grammatical context and historical context. The literal meaning is held to correspond to the intention of the authors. Now, if I stuff that phrase grammatical context with a whole bunch of other stuff, I can agree with that principle. The problem is the people that hold to this don't put as many things in that grammatical context as, as I've shown you belong there. Now, we allowed for the use of at least 15 different literary devices commonly used by the writers of the first century. Many of those are not conducive to a plain literal meaning, okay? Now, I've used metaphor often. A metaphor is not conducive to a plain literal meaning. But if I consider it according to its grammatical context, I can understand it. Um, there's a lot of different things used by the Bible. They, uh, some Bible writers do time compression, uh, time expansion. They, they will uh, take what was a monologue and, and turn it into a dialogue for a dramatic effect. There's a lot of things uh, that are done in literary devices. Very common in, in the time the Bible was written that some of these wouldn't be used today. But because, like the New Testament, you're looking at first century writers. And if we look at other first century books, and they employed those types of things, not only did they employ those literary devices, they wrote textbooks on how to write history. And they tell you in the textbook that you should employ these. Okay? So I hold that fact that the Bible is written according to the standards of the time it was written in and not according to 21st century standards of how we would write history today. Okay? Now, I affirm, as did Augustine and Aquinas, that the other layers of meaning are not disconnected from a literal meaning. Okay? But they give in the many types of non-literal uh, literary devices shown to have been employed by the first century writers, we deny that the literal meaning is always found in the plain literal reading of the passage. It's, it's that phrase, the plain literal reading, that makes this uh, statement completely nonsensical. It would be illogical to read poet, poetic language literally, right? It's equally illogical to read apocalyptic imagery literally or to read many of the literary devices employed by the writers of the Bible, literally. Uh, so we seek, and what we sought in our methodology is to understand the author's intended meaning by considering what literary devices, if any, were being employed. And that's part of the, the study and the background that we had to do to get ready for this book. I also tried to show to be demonstrably false Sorry, Article 7 of the Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics. Now, a lot of fine scholars sign this, this statement. But Article 7 says, We affirm the meaning expressed in each biblical text is single, definite, and fixed. We deny that the recognition of a single meaning eliminates a variety of applications. Now, I took you to Galatians 4, verses 21 to 31, most often as my proof text. I, I can use others, and I did use other passages, but Paul takes the story of Abraham and Sarah and I, uh, Hagar and the two boys, Isaac and Ishmael, and then interprets it allegorically. Now, everybody agrees, Paul believes that the story was real, had a historical meaning, and he gave it a second allegorical meaning, not a different application, a different meaning. So that proves there's at least two meanings in that passage. Then I did the Quadriga of Scripture, which is how the church understood Scripture for almost, well, up until the Reformation, it was highly pop, prob, uh, popular. After the Reformation, it became less popular, but it because we were moving to a more rational, more reasonable, uh, kind of uh, naturalistic type move in, in understanding the Bible. But 
I argued that the quadriga is actually the correct way to understand scripture. And the quadriga says there's four layers of meaning in the passages of the Bible. And I think that's absolutely true. Maybe not always four. Maybe there's three sometimes and two at other times. But there are clearly multiple layers of meaning. And especially in the uh, book of Revelation, I think there is very likely four layers of meaning. So because I showed that the statement on biblical hermeneutics, that Article 7 of that statement is absolutely untrue and demonstrably untrue, we denied that the meaning in, in expressed in each biblical text is singular, right? While affirming that the meaning is definite and fixed. One can, can't simply invent a new allegorical meaning for the passages that is disconnected from the original. What I mean from that is you will see people today that will say that the Bible is, is uh, allegory for the mind or whatever, no, no, and the ego and the id. And, and I, I listened to somebody as long as I could online that was doing this. They were creating a new allegorical meaning for the scripture that had no connection to the literal meaning of the text at all. That is what uh, uh, people like Aquinas were arguing against, doing that, making that disconnection, that he said it's all based in that literal. But literal, when I'm saying literal, I mean literal in, the, in the allowing for all those different literary devices, right? And we tried to set aside our pre-understandings of what we think the book says. I did my best to set aside my pre-understandings of what the book of Revelation meant as, as we did this. Or it, and if I couldn't totally set them aside, I tried to acknowledge what they were so that you understood when, uh, you know, I'm fighting against a, a bias on some points. But I'm trying to set aside those pre-understandings but there are some pre-understandings that I'm not setting aside. I'm not setting aside the pre-understanding that any book of the Bible has to fit within the whole larger context of the rest of the Bible. Okay? I'm not setting aside the pre-understanding that uh, the same images are used over and over in the Bible. You know, those are there. So I'm just setting aside my, my interpretive grid, but while still... Um, understanding that there are um, there's one author the Holy Spirit wrote the whole Bible through all these different authors and that it's not disconnected one from the other so when the Bible describes evil as a chaos monster uh, either a seven-headed sea monster pictured as the Leviathan or a land monster of the behemoth in the Old Testament, and then we come into Revelation, and suddenly we get this seven-headed monster rising up out of the sea, it reminds us to look back at, at the book of Job and, and some other, uh, and the story of Jonah, and, and you go, wait a second, is that what John's talking about? Is this a chaos monster he's dealing with? And the Bible also gives us numerous accounts of disobedient celestial beings or sometimes called angels or sons of God who were uh, positionally defeated by Christ on the cross. When he died and rose from the dead, th that battle was over. But he hasn't closed escrow, so to speak. He hasn't come back and actually uh, thrown them in, in prison and, and dealt with them. That's coming. Now, I hold to what's sometimes called a Deuteronomy 32 worldview that sees a lot of uh, these um, celestial beings. In Deuteronomy 32, 8, it talks about the God divided the nations according to the sons of God, the number of the sons of God. Now, many of your translations are going to say according to the number of the sons of Israel. That Those translations are wrong. Okay, the Septuagint is correct, in my opinion. Uh, the, Israel did not exist then for them to be divided according to the sons of Israel. And what happened is God set up celestial beings as subordinate people over all the other nations. And he said, except for Israel, that's mine. I'll cover Israel. And you guys deal with all the Gentile nations. 
And some of those celestial beings sought worship for themselves, and they become the gods, the other Elohim of the Old Testament, the Baal, the Astarte, the Molochs, all these other false gods. These are disobedient celestial beings, and they're going to get dealt with. And from chapter 12 on in, in the book of Revelation, they are being dealt with. So I commend that, and because I have that Deuteronomy 32 worldview, it, it's going to impact how I'm seeing that part of the Bible. Whereas if you don't think that happened and you don't believe in territorial spirits and that any of this happened and you think the gods in the Old Testament, uh, the other Elohim aren't there and that God's comparing himself to non-existent beings when he says who else, what other Elohim is like Yahweh, that he's making a comparison to beings that don't exist. If that's your position, it's going to affect how you understand scripture my position is that when the Bible says who, what other Elohim is like Yahweh, that those Elohim are literal and they're pretending to be gods or acting like gods, but they're created beings, right? Now, I also try to point out that we affirm when it comes to eschatology, the study of last things, that only a few things are essential for salvation and it would be foolish to look for a return of Christ if there was no God. If the Son didn't literally become flesh, live, die, and, and rise again. and Or if you believe there's no afterlife or no final judgment. you know. So those background beliefs are kind of eternal or uh, essential for salvation. But your actual view of end times is not. A few other things are essential for historic or traditional Christian orthodoxy. Uh, I think I said full preterism uh, falls outside of that because it denies that Jesus is going to come again. They're saying that they're still orthodox because he did come again, right, in, the, in 70 AD. And uh, what do you call it? The rest of the issues surrounding our study are either important and non-essential, right, or they are uh, speculative. Right? You know, we're in, in the speculation here. And, and I have used this chart many times. Michael Patton created it. Uh, it's a good friend of mine. Uh, and he is uh, definitely holds to the literal principle of biblical interpretation. He would affirm uh, uh, Article 7 of the uh, thing. So we have difference of opinion. But we're clear, both of us, on where to divide. And eschatology is not here. We have too many people in the Christian church that take things that belong out in the not important or maybe important but not essential or sometimes pure speculation, and they move it into essential for uh, especially denominational orthodoxy. I give you an example. I attended Calvary Chapel for years, and they made your belief in the pre-tribulation rapture a part of their statement of faith. And if you were going to be a teacher and, and anything in, uh, there, you had to hold to that. So I'm, I ran over, and I want to end this, and God willing, I'll see you back, but maybe we can, uh, I'll see you over at Michael's, and isn't uh, that great? But I'm not going to do a closing song. I'm just getting out of here because I want to go over to uh, Michael for uh, bended knee. And God bless you all for Tune in back in, and I will see you again. And I'll read the chat and uh, answer you next time. Thank you.